This is Barry Zalma, Zalma on Insurance. I'm an attorney who has retired from the practice of law and now spend my time as an insurance claims consultant and expert witness and author and producer of these videos. Today I'd like to speak about the law of unintended consequences and the Kumis decision that requires insurers to provide independent counsel if there is a conflict between the insurer and the insured. When considering independent counsel, the insurance claims professional should also consider the decision of the California Court of Appeal and Center Foundation versus Chicago Insurance Company. The Center for Feeling Therapy and its therapists were sued for medical malpractice and on various intentional tort theories. One of the Center's insurers, Chicago Insurance Company, following a partially directed verdict in favor of the insureds, sued to avoid payment of independent counsel selected by the insured. The center and its therapists were sued by at least 50 former patients in over a dozen lawsuits alleging a variety of intentional torts and professional malpractice. The former patients claimed they had been subjected to violence and psychological coercion to compel them to donate their services and their money to the center, and they sought more than $300 million in damages for the harm done to them. Because of the conflict created by the carrier's reservations of rights, many of the defendants retained their own attorneys. Following the decision in Kumis called the San Diego Federal Credit Union versus the Kumis Insurance Society. A group called the Woldenberg Group renewed its demand for defense under the control of a law firm called Barish and Hill. The Woldenberg Group, acting through Barash and Hill, concurrently discharged Fonda and Gerard, the firm retained by Chicago and demanded that Fonda and Girard cease all work on the cases. Eventually, all of the carriers except Chicago agreed to contribute to Barash and Hill's fees. The Woldenberg Group then settled its bad faith claims with all the carriers except Chicago and went to trial against Chicago to recover $1.7 million dollars the amount Barash and Hill claimed to be still due on their total bill of $3.2 million. In its case in chief, the Woldenberg Group presented evidence to establish Chicago's duty to defend and its refusal to do so. The two named partners were not experienced medical malpractice litigators. Anthony Barash admitted that he was not a litigator at all and joked that as a business lawyer he couldn't find the courthouse because he hadn't been there in ten years. Jerry Hill had never tried a malpractice case. Anne Catherine Steele, the attorney assigned by Barash and Hill to have primary management responsibility for the defense, had not only never tried a jury case, but had also never taken a deposition before her involvement in the litigation. Other lawyers involved in the litigation described Barash and Hill as working the file for billing purposes and as a way below the standard of competency in the field. Chicago also challenged the reasonableness of the fees charged by Barash and Hill who had billed for a total of 19,379.4 hours in defending the case, including 1,129 and a half hours or about $180,000 for a summary judgment motion described by Chicago's expert witness as a hopeless waste of time inasmuch as it was filed on the eve of trial 
and it was inconceivable that there weren't disputes as to issues of fact. The summary judgment motion was never heard. Barash and Hill billed 263 hours for the preparation of one defendant for his deposition and an additional 85 hours for the firm's preparation for the same deposition, a total of 348 hours. 8.7 weeks on a 40 billable hour week basis for preparing three other defendants for their depositions, Barash and Hill billed 118 hours, almost three weeks. 131 and a half hours, three weeks plus a day or so, and 140 hours, three and a half weeks. Barash and Hill then billed for the time spent preparing deposition summaries between 40 and 87 hours for each deposition. Summaries described by Chicago's expert as useless because it would take as long to read the summaries as the depositions themselves. Barash and Hill's fees included billings by a single attorney for more than 24 hours in a day and for 78 hours over a four-day period. Paralegals and secretaries were sometimes billed as attorneys at attorney's rates. Time spent on non-insured cases was billed to Chicago. Several witnesses described Barash and Hill's bills as unconscionable, unreasonable, utterly inconceivable, absolutely outrageous, and way out of bounds over Chicago's strenuous objection. The trial court determined that the Woldenberg Group had an absolute right to select its own attorneys, even if they couldn't find the courthouse door, a right which would could not be usurped by Chicago under any circumstances, and thus directed a verdict on the Woldenberg Group's claim for breach of contract, instructing the jury as a matter of law. Chicago's refusal to pay Barash and Hill's fees constitute a breach of contract, and that the only issue for the jury on the breach of contract claim was damages. Based on that instruction, the jury retained a, returned a verdict awarding $1,699,999 to the Woldenberg Group on the breach of contract claim, $1, only $1 less than the amount requested in final arg argument, and also finding that Chicago had breached its covenant of good faith and fair dealing. Although the jury specifically found that Chicago had acted with malice and oppression, it did not award punitive damages, although it did award another $200,000 for attorney's fees incurred in prosecuting the bad faith action. The trial court added prejudgment interest in the amount of $449,340.42. The question then was whether there was, at the times relevant to this dispute, any limitation on an insured's right to select independent counsel to be compensated by the insurer in conflict situations created by the insurer's reservation of rights. Chicago asked the court to hold that Section 2860 of the C Civil Code, enacted in 1987, applied retroactively to this dispute because Chicago would then be able to claim a statutory right to require the counsel selected by the insured to possess certain minimum qualifications. Ten years before the center closed and the litigation started, the California courts had recognized the conflict inherent in an insurer's reservation of rights and the need for independent counsel to protect the insured when the interests of the insurer and the insured diverged. 
In the appellate court's view, the duty of good faith imposed upon an insured includes the obligation to act reasonably in selecting independent counsel, an experienced attorney qualified to present a meaningful defense and willing to engage in ethical billing practices susceptible to review at a standard stricter than that of the marketplace. Conduct arguably acceptable in the ordinary attorney-client relationship, where the latter pays the former from his own pocket, is not necessarily appropriate in the tripartite context created when independent counsel undertakes to represent the insured at the expense of the insurer. This is not a new concept. Accordingly, while no California case decided prior to 1982 had expressly held that an insurer had a right to reject independent counsel selected by its insured, it certainly cannot be said that as a matter of law, Chicago breached its obligation to the Woldenberg Group by asserting a right to approve the attorneys retained by its insureds provided such approval was not unreasonably withheld. The question whether Chicago breached its contractual duty to its insureds required a factual finding whether it unreasonably refused to approve the Woldenberg Group's selection of Barash and Hill. Although the trial court determined the breach occurred when Chicago first refused to retain Barash and Hill, the court did not perceive this answer to be required as a matter of law. It followed inescapably that the error in directing a verdict on the issues of breach and the date thereof was prejudicial and required reversal. The good intentions to protect insureds from attorneys appointed by an insurer resulted in an incompetent, an inexperienced group of lawyers to overbill and take advantage of the insurer. And by so doing, the ethical requirements of the insurer were met, and the ethical obligation of the lawyers and their clients were breached. And therefore, the decision of the trial court was reversed and the lawyers were chastised. This video was adapted from my book, Ethics for the Insurance Professional, Second Edition, which is available both as a Kindle book and as a paperback from Amazon.com. If you found this video to be of interest to you or useful, please forward it to your colleagues. It's free. And remember that sometimes even the best of all decisions, like the Kumis decision, which protected many insureds from lawyers retained by insurers who had an absolute conflict of interest could still suffer the unintended consequences of the insured hiring lawyers who didn't know their way to the courthouse, let alone how to defend the case. Please subscribe or follow me on Rumble and on YouTube and my blog so that you can be advised of future blog postings and videos. Thank you for your attention.